sharing with each other. Keep reaching out and of course share your prayer requests with us here. Um, your joys and your concerns alike, go ahead and post them in the comments or, or send them directly to me. Uh, we'll get to them uh, in, in our prayer time in, in a few minutes. Uh, a few announcements for you. A few things that are coming up. The first is that uh, next Sunday, I've been talking about this for a while now, but next Sunday will be our Duke intern's first Sunday with us. Our intern this year is named Linda Arlene Hoxett, and she'll be joining us virtually, at least for the first month, and then we'll, we'll see after that, kind of depending on Duke's policies and, and how things unfold. Um, but in anticipation of that, we're going um, to give y'all a chance to meet her this week, virtually, uh, probably on Thursday. We have not confirmed that yet, but I'm leaning toward Thursday, if I can confirm that with Linda Arlene um, during the Bible study time, she'll be joining us virtually and uh, allow her to kind of introduce herself to y'all and, and y'all to introduce yourselves to her and also allow us to try out this technology that we're going to be springing on ourselves next Sunday in a way that we can include um, more than just me sitting in front of a camera even as we're spread out. So uh, pay attention uh, to Facebook, pay attention to your emails and phone calls, whatever you can um, for more announcements concerning how that's going to unfold. Also, coming up, uh, as, as things reopen here in North Carolina and as we're watching um, what our, our leaders say, both our, our church leaders and our, our political leaders, and just watching what happens as things are reopening and we see how things go, we're, we're beginning the reopening phase as far as our facilities. You know, the, the church has never closed. Uh, we've just changed how we've been doing things. And so uh, our first step in that uh, as long as things uh, go according to plan, is on June 7th, so starting in June, June 7th, in addition to what we've been doing online, we're also going to start doing regularly um, drive-in worship services on Sunday mornings. So if you're within the area and you can drive up here and, and sit in your car and, and worship together in that way, uh, we'll, we'll be doing that. And, and again, um, details will be forthcoming. Um, that's it. Those are the announcements that I have this morning. 
Um, oh, yeah, of course, uh, as always, I want to encourage you to um, continue supporting the, the ministries of this church through your, your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness in, in whatever form that takes uh, at, at this strange, unprecedented time. Um, and, of course, we need your, your financial gifts as well uh, to maintain uh, the work of this church during this time. And, and there are three ways that you can give. You can go to our church website, which is centerumcsanford.org. And at the bottom of that homepage, uh, there's a link that says donate. You can click on that and donate. Uh, you can also click on the donate button here on our Facebook page, uh, which I, I encourage you to do that before doing the other way, because I learned uh, this past week that um, Facebook does not charge us for your donations. The other link, there's a, a small percentage that they take out. Facebook, 100% of your donations go to the church. So I encourage you to do it that way or to, to mail in your checks to the church address. Um, yeah. So thank you. Thank you to everyone that has been um, going out of the way and going the extra mile to continue to support the ministry of this church. Not only financially, but, but so many other ways as well. Uh, if you will, join me in our opening prayer. I sent out the bulletin by email last night and uh, posted it here on Facebook. You, you should be able to find it that way. Join with me in our opening prayer. Oh God, Holy One, our altar, our cloud. In the resurrection of your Son, you have brought us into your temple. Accept the sacrifices we offer and draw us into the fire of your Spirit. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And hallelujah. Sing with me as you're able. Our opening hymn, I Stand Amazed in the Presence.
I kind of took a little bit out of my voice there. Um, hope y'all were able to, to sing with me and enjoy that. Uh, let's share our joys and our concerns with one another. What's, what's going on in your life and in your world right now that uh, you want to celebrate? What's going on in your life and your world that you want others to be in prayer for? I came up here uh, yesterday afternoon to get some work done. And um, I was not the only one up here. I was the only one in the building, but um, a couple of folks are over working out the garden. I stepped over to, to say hello to them and to um, return some, some tools to one of them. And um, I couldn't get away because more people kept on coming up. It seemed every time I was over there, more people were, were driving by, I'm sure. All of y'all are, are as anxious to get out and about as I am uh, here lately, especially after all the rain this week. Um, but it was good. It was good to see faces and to hear voices. Uh, that, that was a joy for me, and definitely a joy that we had all that um, sunshine yesterday following all that rain earlier this week. So that's definitely uh, my joy. Sam says on here that he's celebrating radishes. Um, if I liked radishes more, I might be celebrating with them. Not that I don't like them. Just, there are better vegetables, Sam. But celebrating radishes, absolutely. Um, and greens and, and everything else that's growing in our garden right now. <clears throat> One of the people that I saw uh, yesterday who stopped by while we were out working was Marvin, uh, Marvin Gaster. And um, I forgot to ask him, but, but I heard uh, earlier this week from him, his son, Michael, um, underwent gallbladder surgery. I believe, I'm not positive, I believe it was um, unexpected gallbladder surgery. Uh, so we want to keep that in our prayers, keep Marvin in our prayers. His, his, health, is, um, his health is stable, but it, it's, not, um, it's not great. It's, it's, it's stably not great, um, but he is still able to get out of the bell. So we want to keep Marvin uh, and his son Michael in our prayers. Um, Carolee's sister, who we've been praying for, Ruth Dunlap, is still uh, continuing to recover. She, uh, a few weeks ago, had a fall and broke her, her hip and her shoulder and, and had to undergo surgery and and that's, that's hard enough and, and made all the more so by the fact that she's 92 years old and there's always a lot of things to consider with that. So keep uh, Ruth in your prayers. Uh, a couple of our church members, Ina Mae Spivey and Virginia White, they've, they've both been in the, in the hospital recently. Um, not for long stretches by any means, but, um, but they've been in there and are both recovering at home. So continue praying for them. Uh, Heard through the, the prayer chain this week, Pam Hall's uh, brother, David Cummings, is, has started treatment for cancer, so we want to pray for him, as well as uh, Pam, I don't know Pam's last name, but she's the daughter of Eileen Kelly. Uh, we shared it, all time is running together, but it's been sometime within the last few weeks um, that she was diagnosed with cancer and, and recently had to go um, surgery for that, and um, it was originally going to be very, very extensive surgery. Um, it still was, but it was not as extensive a surgery as originally thought. So that's both a, a celebration and an ongoing concern. Um, Jana asked that we be in prayer for her supervisor, Billy Tatum, who had a medical procedure earlier this week, and also that we uh, keep Tommy's friend, Tony Williamson, in our prayers, who's been in the hospital with a blood infection that started his arm. And then finally, Linda Higgins asked that we keep her brother Bill and his family in our prayers uh, following the passing. Now, I believe it was Bill's wife uh, who passed away. So uh, I know um, Linda has, has, has gone through a lot of, of needs lately with her own health and, and um, her family being stretched out and, and uh, all that going on. So keep, keep praying for Linda and her family. Uh, I don't see any other prayer requests coming in through our comments right now. So uh, if you have any, um, keep sharing them. Share them again through comments. Send them to private message or post them. Um, send them by email, text, whatever you got. Let's go ahead and, and go to the Lord in Prayer. Almighty God, you have given us a new day a new opportunity to celebrate you and all that you've done for us and who you are. Lord, you are the giver of all good things, and even in the midst of pandemic, in the midst of anxiety, in the midst of concerns over the future, there is still, even in that, no end to the goodness that you're pouring out on us. 
So we thank you for all the blessings that are in our lives, confessing that we do not take the time to be thankful enough, confessing that we do not love you as you deserve, even as you have loved us beyond what we deserve. Lord, we have turned our backs on you, we have failed you, we have done everything that you told us not to do, and very little that you told us to do. We have not loved our neighbor. We have not heard the cry of the needy. We have been selfish and sinned against you. Lord, search out our hearts. Root out the sin that grows so deeply in us. By the power of your grace, provided through the blood of Christ on his cross, may we be freed, not only from the guilt of sin, but from the power. May your grace abound in our lives and through our lives, may your grace abound in our world so that it may become your world as it truly is. We turn over to you all the anxieties that we carry. We turn over to you all the worries that we bear unnecessarily. We entrust into your hands those whom we love and are scared for. We lift up those who are hurting we pray for the physically ill and the mentally ill. We pray for the emotionally broken, the grieving, the sorrowful. We ask healing of bodies and minds and souls. We ask for healing in our relationships with one another. Teach us to forgive as you forgive. Heal our homes. Heal our church. Heal our community, our nation, and our world. Lord, we know that you hear our prayers. We know that hearing you answer. And so we praise you for that. We praise you for the mighty glory that is yours. Were it not for you, there would be nothing for us. And yet in you, you have given us everything. So we praise you and we join with the saints who even now this day surround your throne, praying as you taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and lead us not to temptation. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Crack myself up there. Um, one of the things you probably might not realize about being a pastor is uh, we've got a lot going on in our heads while we do this. And sometimes when, when we do uh, things that uh, we typically do, like saying the Lord's Prayer, our, our mouths start to go on autopilot and our brains start going somewhere else and we realize halfway through that we have no idea what we're saying in the Lord's Prayer. And that happened to me, and I'm, I'm, I think I got it in the right order. Um, I threw debts in there, not trespassing that. That's how it goes. That's how it goes. Um, grace abounds. Amen. Our scripture this morning, we're finishing up 1 Peter. This is uh, the, the final Sunday in the Easter season, which sounds like a weird thing to say because every Sunday is a little Easter. Um, but next Sunday uh, starts Pentecost, um, or next Sunday is Pentecost Sunday, and we'll get into all of that next Sunday. But we're finishing up 1 Peter today, and um, jumping, we're, we're doing a part out of the middle of chapter 4 and a part out of the middle of chapter 5. Uh, just go with it. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 14, and then chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. May the church hear what the Spirit is saying. Dear friends, don't be surprised about the fiery trials that have come among you to test you. These are not strange happenings. Instead, rejoice as you share Christ's suffering. You share his suffering now, so you may also have overwhelming joy when his glory is revealed. If you are mocked because of Christ's name, you are blessed. For the Spirit of glory, indeed the Spirit of God, rests on you. Therefore, humble yourselves under God's power, so he may raise you up on the last day. Throw all your anxiety onto him, 
because he cares about you. Be clear-headed. Keep alert. Your accuser, the devil, is on the prowl like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. Do so in the knowledge that your fellow believers are enduring the same suffering throughout the world. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, the one who called you into his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, will himself restore, empower, strengthen, and establish you. To him be power forever and always. Amen. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, you are among us and we are in your midst. Your word has been read, may it be heard, may it be understood, may it be lived out. May your word transform our lives. May we become what the world needs us to be. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. So I have uh, at no point in my life ever looked over at my shoulder and seen a little devil in, in a red tail and pitchfork. Hopefully that's not a surprise to you. That, that image, the devil on your shoulder and an angel on the other shoulder, it's, it's a common trope um, in, in entertainment, especially in kids' cartoons. and it, It's a pretty decent image of kind of the, the conflict that comes with making a moral decision. But it's not an accurate depiction of devils or angels. And kind of focusing on that, which, you know, pop culture tends to make us focus on things and picture things a certain way, focusing on that gives us a, a wrong idea about the devil, and about angels especially, or both, but uh, oftentimes we, we kind of see the devil as that, that tempter there on our shoulder, the one that, that's just hanging out and, and waiting for some sort of a, a moral quandary to come along and, and then pushing us towards selfishness and wickedness and sin. And to be sure that that's one of the things that the devil does. He is a tempter. Uh, but honestly, the devil is much subtler than that. See, he's, he's crafty and he's sneaky. The devil's not going to look like we expect and he's not going to sound like we expect. We're not going to get the pitchfork and the horns and the, the red tail. Peter tells us here in this passage that the devil is roaming around like a roaring lion. Now, I, I, I love uh, nature documentaries, and um, I've seen enough of them, enough of the National Geographic specials, to know that lions don't go screeching across the savanna uh, trying to catch gazelles and zebras and other things. No, lions go sneaking across the savanna. They get down low and they quietly, slowly make the way through the tall grass, hiding, coming to just within a few feet, just within arm's grasp. And they also don't work alone, typically. They work in prides, actually is what it's called, a pack of lions is a pride, looking for the animal that's already tired, that's already weak, the one that's already injured or sick. Because that's the easiest time to bring it down. In my experience, that's much more accurate portrayal of the devil than the red guy on your shoulder is. See, Peter tells us that the devil is roaming around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. That goes beyond just tempting us to do something bad. What the devil wants to do to me and, and to you and, and to all of us is to devour us, to destroy our lives, to bring everything crumbling down. The devil wants to take away our joy, take away our hope, take away our peace, take away our love. And honestly, he's pretty good at doing those things. Now this week, um, this week was tough in my house. There's been a lot of tough weeks since this whole thing started. The kids uh, who were three and six years old 
are doing virtual schooling from home. Three and six year olds are not designed to do virtual schooling and their school is not designed to be done virtually. And so there's been all sorts of clashes and, and headbutting and, and tears and yelling and tantrums thrown over this. And now we're coming to the, the school year's ending and, and Lucy's ended this week. Castine's still got a couple more weeks to go. But they're, they're sick and tired of it. And Jessica and I are sick and tired of it too. And speaking of Jessica, her job hasn't ended. She's still working. She's teaching violin and she's doing it all virtually, kind of like this. She's, she's sitting in front of a camera staring at it for 30 hours a week. Just her in our, in our makeshift little office, looking at a camera, talking to kids, talking to students. She's, she's getting interaction with them, of course, but it's just not the same as, as actual personal interaction. And she's sick and tired of that. And I'm sick and tired of trying to make my work schedule work around her work schedule, but mine's more flexible, so I have to be more flexible. And I, I'm not really a flexible guy. <laughs> Anytime we go out, it's, it's an ordeal now. We have to make sure, like, do we have our masks? Do we have our hand sanitizer? We don't want to uh, have to stop anywhere unnecessarily. So you know, have we done everything? Do we have everything? When we get there, are they going to have everything? And we make a, a grocery list and say, well, I think they're going to have most of this, but we just don't know. So we're all just getting sick and tired of the way that we've been living our lives since March 13th. Emotions have been very high and very raw lately, and, and that's spilling out in the way that we interact with each other, in the way that my family that we're, we're rubbing up against one another. None of us are really able to do what we want to do right now, and, and we're on edge and, and we're set off just so easily. Um, I made french fries the other night as part of supper, and, and Jessica told me that the french fries, I mean, they're just frozen french fries. The french fries were not as good as the fresh potatoes I had made earlier in the week, and for whatever reason, like, that was enough to make me upset. We're all on, on edge, and we're all raw. And, and on top of that, this week, it, it rained. And it rained. And it rained, and it rained, and it rained, and we couldn't go outside and enjoy it like we used to like we're used to doing. So it was a tough week in the Dave's house. And when I'm having weeks like this one has been, and let's be honest, when I'm having months like the last two and a half have been, that's when the devil starts devouring me. It's not with huge temptations or, or momentous spiritual decisions. No, he's, he's much more subtle than that. He's much more sneaky than that. See, the devil likes to whisper to me. He likes, when I'm having these hard weeks, when I'm having hard months, when, when things seem out of control, he likes to come up to me and just whisper in my ear, you're doing a really bad job. Or, that was a really stupid thing you did. He likes to point to what other people are doing and say, they're so much better at this than you are. While I'm, I'm sitting in front of my computer writing something for the church or, or for whatever, or planning things out, uh, he likes to tell me, wow, nobody's going to read that. Nobody's listening to you. Nobody's doing what you're asking them. The more and more mentally and emotionally and spiritually exhausted I get, the louder and faster those whispers come. And when I'm past the point of exhaustion, those whispers become the primary thing I hear. And I start saying them to myself. Man, I'm doing a bad job. Nobody's doing what I asked them to. Nobody's listening. Nobody cares. Now maybe you've heard that same voice whispering in your ear. Maybe the, the devil likes to go after you the same way he comes after me. It's a very effective means. It's a very effective attack. 
The devil is a tempter. It's tempting to give in to those whispers. The devil is an accuser. And so he's convincing me that not only are these accusations right, but that I should be accusing myself of not doing a good job or not doing enough or, or whatever it is. And he's a liar. We know that. We know that the devil is a liar. But he's so good at lying because he takes a little lie and wraps it up in something that's true. It's, it's like, it's like a, a fishing fly that just looks so much like a, a fly, like a bug landing on the water that you can't see the hook in the middle of it. Right now, the devil is, is out there. He's among us. He's with you and he's with me and, and he's like that ravenous, hungry lion looking for that opportunity, that, that moment of distraction, that moment of tiredness, that moment of weakness to pounce and devour. But what else does Peter say other than that bit about the devil here. In today's passage, Peter tells us, humble yourselves. Humble yourselves under God's power. Throw all of your anxiety onto Him. Be clear-headed. Keep alert. Resist the devil, standing firm in your faith. Now look, all of that stuff, that's very easy to say. It's not always easy to, to live out, though. There have been a lot of anxieties in my house lately. There have been a lot of anxieties in myself lately. And I've tried casting them on to God, and every time I do, it feels like they're, they're just stuck. I'm trying to pitch those anxieties away, and, and they're not going away. Maybe you've felt that, too. Chances are you have. That phrase in... Uh, 1 Peter 5, 8, be clear-headed. That phrase, for whatever reason, just lodged itself in my brain this week. In the midst of, of all the mess, in the midst of all the rain, that phrase, be clear-headed, stuck with me. What does that mean, to be clear-headed, in, in, in light of this? I want you to consider being lost in the woods. Now, I have had more experience being lost in the woods than I ought to. If you're lost in the woods, simplest solution is to go back the way you came, right? I'm somehow turn around, I just need to reverse course, go back the way I came. The thing is, we're really bad at that. People were, just, were terrible at being able to go back the way we came. This is how people end up lost in the woods for days on end because we go back to the direction that we think we came in, but we're not really sure if that is the actual direction because we're very bad at holding a straight line. We, we wonder and we meander more than we realize we do. Even trying to walk through the woods in, in one direction, we're just trying to get around all the trees and, and underbrush that's going to stand in your way. It's incredibly hard to head one direction. So what ends up happening and how people get lost in the woods for days on end is they get confused. And in that state of confusion, they start making confused decisions. And then confused decision on top of confused decision on top of confused decision all builds together into a confused human. A confused, wandering, lost person in the woods. And in any kind of situation like that, what you need is some sort of fixed point. You need that magnetic north, or you need that north star, that thing that's not going to move and is able to give you solid bearings. As long as you can keep that fixed point in your sight, then you can make wise, informed decisions on how to proceed forward which direction you need to move in. That is being clear-headed. The same is true for Christians. The devil is like a hungry lion seeking to devour us. And we are at our most vulnerable when we're worn down, when we're mentally and emotionally and spiritually exhausted, 
when we're turned around and confused and we're not sure uh, what's right and true and good anymore. See, we need to remain clear-headed, focused on a fixed point in our lives so that the devil does not devour us. And what is that fixed point for Christians? It's the cross of Jesus Christ. That is the fixed point that throughout his letter, Peter has been bringing us back to over and over and over again. That is the point that our identity must remain attached to. This is the foundation that our faith must stand firmly rooted in. The cross of Jesus Christ is the base of our identity. It is the hallmark of who we truly are. We are loved by God. So much so that he gave his only son to die for us. And because of that cross, our sins are forgiven. Because of that cross, we have been freed not only from the guilt and consequences of our sins, but from the power of sin. Because of that cross, we are no longer the devils to be devoured as he wills. Because of that cross, we are beloved children of God. We are heirs to the King of Kings. Now, I don't know what kind of week you're having. I don't know what kind of week lies ahead for you. I hope for all of us it's a good week. But I can't promise you that it's going to be. I hope that we don't get another four or five days in a row of nonstop rain, but I can't guarantee you that. What I can guarantee you is this. God loves you no matter what. And that love that God has for you has already overcome everything else, including that hungry, ravenous devil. Your identity is established and forever linked to the work that Jesus Christ finished on the cross. No matter what temptations, no matter what accusations, no matter what lies come against you, cross overcomes them all. Even when it doesn't feel true. Even when the temptations and accusations and lies seem to just drag you down and drown you out and blind you to God. Even that is not enough to overcome the power of the cross. So stand firm in your faith. Whatever you're going through right now, Stand firm in your faith, trusting in the blood of Jesus Christ, even if you feel like you're being devoured. In the words of Peter, after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, the one who called you into his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, will himself restore, empower, strengthen, and establish you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the cross, for what you did on the cross, what you have accomplished for us through the cross. May we always keep our eyes on that. And Lord, no matter how we feel, no matter what we think this world is doing to us, may we trust in your victory that has overcome this world already. May we trust that promise that you will restore, empower, strengthen, and establish us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us turn our eyes on Jesus and prepare ourselves for whatever lies ahead this week by singing together, Jesus, keep me near the cross. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There a precious fountain, free.
Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.